by the epic wonders, the friendly faces, and incredible new adventures that will change you and the way you see the world. Right here in Queensland. Hi, and welcome to the World Science Festival Brisbane and to this very interesting session about how to change the world. I'm Professor Ian Fraser from the University of Queensland, and it's my pleasure to be your host for this discussion this afternoon. Today we're going to be joined by some very interesting people, but before we do, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, their elders past, present and emerging, and recognize their traditional owners' contribution to science over 50,000 years. The discussion this afternoon will be with four panelists, and I'd like to introduce them all briefly to you. Amelia Telford, Bianca Lay, Corey Toot, and here in the studio, Merta Snooks. So we're going to talk about some really interesting topics this afternoon. We're going to cover climate change. We're going to cover food security. We're going to cover rocket science. And then we're going to cover the place of science in the world at large. And we're going to hope for some really interesting insights from some young, enthusiastic scientists about what science is all about for them. So I'm going to start, first of all, with Amelia Telford. And I'd like to start her off by saying, what really gets you out of bed in the morning these days? Oh, so much. A good coffee, which, you know, you can have multiple in a day. <laughs> um, no, but really, you know, there's, as a um, proud Bundjalung and South Sea Islander woman, um, as an Indigenous person, um, I feel such a deep responsibility to, um, you know, be able to acknowledge that right now the world that we're living in, there's a lot of injustices that, um, you know, too often our people are on the front lines of and we face the first and worst impacts. And um, I really couldn't imagine getting up out of bed and not not only thinking about that, but doing something to be able to contribute to, um, you know, to give back to our communities and contribute towards making the world a better place. So, so that's what gets me out of bed. So tell us about the Seed Indigenous Youth Climate Network, which is your uh, baby, if you like. Yeah, so um, Seed Mob, um, as we call ourselves, the Seed Indigenous Youth Climate Network. Um, we are a national network of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander young people um, all across the continent um, who, you know, are, I guess, you know, coming together to be able to acknowledge that our people are on the front lines of climate change, everything from you know, the digging up and destruction of our country, um, you know, uh, digging up coal, gas, oil, you name it, like that's our, our land that we've that our people have looked after sustainably for tens of thousands of years um, being destroyed in front of our eyes. And and then, you know, when, when those fossil fuels are, are shipped overseas and burnt or burnt in our own country, um, we are facing the, the, the um, impacts of climate change that we're seeing, whether that be rising sea levels in the Torres Strait, um, increased droughts, bushfires, you know, the list really goes on. And, and I think people know now that this isn't just an issue of the future. It's an issue that's impacting our people and our communities right here, right now. Um, and so for us as, as, you know, as the younger generation, um, our people, uh, for us, we make up the majority of our population. And so building the leadership and, you know, empowering younger generations to be leading action for the future that's really what Seed Mob is about, and um, yeah, that's who we are. So, the whole business of climate change has become very political recently, at least in Australia. But really, it should be driven by the science. So, how do you see the science contributing to the political debate? What what really should we be doing to make sure that we teach our leaders and our advisors how climate change is going to impact on the future? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a few things to recognise and acknowledge. Like, firstly, there's the acknowledgement that our people, um, first first peoples, Indigenous people here in this country and around the world, um, are and were the first scientists. And so, you know, there's no doubt that we 
had intricate systems to be able to manage our land um, that allowed us to live sustainably for, you know, over 50, 60, 70,000 years, like since time immemorial. So there's so much knowledge that we have that we need to be able to learn from and recognise um, as being critical in building solutions to climate change. But, you know, for me, I think back to learning about climate change in high school science and, um, you know, that was when I, I guess started to learn about the issue but then connect that with um, my um, understanding of what it means to be an Aboriginal woman and the responsibility that I have to care for country. And, and you know, for me, I started to connect those dots and more and more young people these days are not only learning about these issues, whether it's in, the, in their science classroom or at home or wherever it might be, and are standing up and, and, and realising that, you know, it's not only an urgent issue, but it's an issue of justice and, and we need to be taking action. So, you know, it's undeniable, like 97%, it could even be more these days, 97% um, of, you know, world's leading scientists um, are telling us and have been telling us for a long time that we need to take urgent action now. Um, and really, you know, for me, I, I think that whilst we deny that, we're actually sacrificing some of the world's most vulnerable communities. So, um, you know, science absolutely needs to play a big part in this, um, but also looking to the leadership and knowledge of Indigenous people. So how do we get the message out there better? I mean, we're, we're, clearly we're getting some traction at the moment, but there's a, it's been talked about for a long time now and we still aren't getting there. What do we need to do different? Yeah, I mean, change, you know, on a panel talking about how to change the world, I think we need to find the balance of acknowledging that um, change doesn't happen overnight. It can, um, but we are a part of a long line of, um, you know, people that have been fighting for justice for a long time. Um, when you, you know, when you look at how social change um, happens throughout history, like it's, it's tens of thousands of people coming together, having hundreds of thousands of conversations and changing hearts and minds. And there is a really big shift that's gone on. Like I think, you know, the majority polling shows us that the majority of, of Australians want more action on climate change and, you know, don't support government investing or throwing billions of dollars to the gas industry or dying coal industry. Um, you know, people are um, on our side and I think it's about being able to build that people power because, you know, people power will trump political power, like, because, you know, it's it's up to us to be able to shift those values and force our politicians and the big, you know, big business that they're in bed with to be able to come on that shift with us and, um, and you know, and really to hold them, hold them accountable. So do we need more evidence? I mean, the, the whole business of science is driven by ev ev evidence and we can't do experiments in the climate change area in quite the same way that we would do in the lab. But we do, mm. we do need to have a solid base of evidence that we can put forward to counteract the solid base of pseudo evidence that is being put forward by other groups. Yeah, I think um, to me, I see um, evidence in the form of stories and, you know, storytelling being such a big part of, um, you know, our history and culture as Indigenous people. And, you know, when it comes to those conversations that we need to be having with, with people to shift hearts and minds, it's actually stories from people who, who, who others trust. So whether that's their family or friends or teachers at their universities, wherever that might be. And I think the more we can tell stories of the impact that's going on, but also stories of hope, um, because that's what we need. We, you know, like we have to have hope that change is possible. Um, I absolutely believe we do. And I feel really lucky working in a space where um, every day I get to hear stories of communities around the world and in this country that are leading solutions. And so I think stories need to be seen as, um, you know, evidence. And I'm sure that there's ways to be able to break that down into more specific data for those that need it and like metrics and everything. But the power of a story, um, whether that's hearing it face to face or on your screen, on TV, on social media, like getting those stories out there, I think is going to be quite critical. Well, thank you for that. Tell me, do you have any spare time? And if you do, what do you do with it? 
<laughs> yeah, I do. I mean, look, we really, all of us need to have some balance and, you know, support ourselves because this isn't a sprint, it's a marathon. Um, and so, I mean, for me, I'm super excited this weekend. I'm going camping with my family and I can't wait to get out, um, you know, in the bush, in the salt water um, and be on country. And um, that's where I would spend all my spare time if I could. And you've you've won a couple of awards along the way through your uh, already quite extensive career, although you're very young to be in that position. You've been uh, the NIDOC Youth of the Year and the Young Conservatist of, Conservationist of the Year. Uh, what's the most thing that has excited you in that? What's the proudest moment in your life so far? Um, to be honest, seeing the um, change. Um, that you know we bring about in young people that get involved in seed mob like that is what gives me so much energy and and hope um you know we we have young people get involved as as young as um 13 or 14 15 in high school right through to you know people who are still considered young at the age of 35 and to see the journey that those young people go on um not only in standing up as leaders in their community um calling for justice and action on climate change but being strong in their identity and who they are as aboriginal and torres strait islander people like that's what drives me and that's what i'm most proud of because you know seed is first and foremost um about bringing our mob together on the issue of climate change but there's so much um you know that we've achieved I guess indirectly and um yeah like being able to um bring bring bringing young black people together is just magical like there's magic in a room that happens and some of that's on on us and the team that have been leading it but it's also just like you know generations of um of our ancestors who are guiding us um that's the power and that's what I love and I'm proud of well thank you very much for that interesting insight into your life and for the future i hope all the best for you we'll come back to you later about the future but for the moment we're going to change topic rather dramatically and then we're now going to talk with Myrta snooks now Myrta, you are the managing director of uq space tell us about uq space yes um so we're a student organization um a non-for-profit based at the university of queensland we built and design rockets um, as unqualified engineers, I might add, which to a lot of people sounds a bit dangerous. Mm. Um, but that means that we provide young people the opportunity to have a practical impact um, on science. Engineers, but physicists, um, chemists, um, biologists even. Um, if you think about rocket launches, a lot of people often think about dramatic launches of Tesla payloads uh, in orbit around Mars mm. um, or anything else. We launch smaller rockets. Um, to lower altitudes and do scientific research in the process. So where do they end up going to the rockets? Uh, ours come back down um, completely and are reusable as well. Um, mm. So we do uh, actual uh, um, atmospheric research, for example. Um, we've done an experiment on breathing patterns in, in G-lock, which is something fighter pilots often experience. Um, but we try to make our rockets completely reusable, minus the propellant, which is expense, of course, um, and do science that way. Okay, now you're still studying. Tell me about that. Yes, I'm studying a Bachelor of Engineering and a Bachelor of Arts, um, focusing on political science and international relations in the arts component of my degree and mechanical engineering in the engineering side. Um, I believe at this point in time, it's of vital importance to have a comprehensive understanding of how both these spheres work um, to make a difference in the science community. You want to understand how social constructs work, how the political systems work, how to talk to people and how to navigate for change. Um, and I believe having an understanding of both those means that hopefully I can have a bigger impact overall um, and motivate others to do the same. And where do you think the rocket science is going to lead us in the long run? I mean, are we going to Mars? Are we going to, the, are we going to travel further than that? Or are we going to send sat uh, robots out there to do all the work for us? <laughs> I think both those things are correct. I, I really do think we're going to go um, to Mars at some point but I'm fairly certain we'll stick with rovers um, for the next few years in robotics and research. Um, at the end of the day, well, I think it's of vital importance to focus on this planet. Um, pushing forward and seeing what humanity is capable of has always been a big inspiring challenge um, that has pulled countries together and pulled um, the whole global community to push forward. Um, and, and aiming for that, I think, is still really cool. 
We talk about something not being rocket science. <laughs> is rocket science really rocket science? Is rocket science rocket science? Um, I think it's rocket engineering um, in that sense. The actual science of, of how a rocket launches is not inherently very complex. Uh, what's complex is in getting everything together um, and ensuring it meets your requirements so that it is reusable, so that it is sustainable, um, so that you progress every single time. And that's the challenging part um, of rocket science in that sense. Not so much actually launching something up. So do you hope to go up in a rocket yourself one day? <laughs> Um, no, actually, I'm, I'm not one of the people that would like um, to be launched, not because I don't trust the systems, <laughs> um, but because I think there's a lot more value in, in uh, developing other components at this point, in creating that valuable research and making a difference that way. Okay. Now, your background before you went to university wasn't all about rocket science, was it? Tell us a little bit about that. No, it was very, very different, actually. Um, I took an interesting route. To, to university and to Australia as a whole. Um, I, I never finished high school, um, so I left high school at 15, worked uh, a bunch of miscellaneous fast food and social work jobs, and then decided to come to Australia as a backpacker, um, which is really cool. Uh, I, I would recommend traveling once everything is possible again. Um, but while doing that, I spent some time on a cattle station in regional Queensland, um, which was a completely different experience from um, respecting the land and learning about um, how to actually live practically with nature around you and, and learning to develop and push forward um, with only the resources that you have directly around you, um, which is a really cool skill set and, and cool experiment, I guess, <laughs> to experience, um, which at that point made me realize that just because I didn't finish high school, I shouldn't therefore stop striving um, further and beyond. Um, so I decided to enrol in university and have pushed forward ever since and don't intend to stop anytime soon. Um, yeah. Well, there's a message in that for all of us, I think, that we should try and experiment across life and find out what interests us. How did that lead into rocket science? I mean, there's not an <laughs> obvious connection, is no, there? No, no. Um, and, and often when I mention this story, people, um, people do find it quite odd. I did, growing up, always have um, an enormous fascination for space. I had a a telescope that I uh, looked through. My grandmother took me out to stargazing nights, um, but at no point did I realize, hey, I actually have the capability to, to engineer and create something practical and make something more out of that. Um, and, and that realization qu uh, came to me in the middle of a, <laughs> middle of a field um, <laughs> on a cattle station. There, there is no big other click. It was just the decision um, where, where I was like, no, I, I can actually do this. Um, it doesn't, doesn't matter that I don't have these requirements or anything else. I'm going to be a rocket scientist. I'm going to go do this. And do you think space travel will become routine? I mean, Elon Musk would like us all to <laughs> so sign up for $250,000 seats in his next flight off the planet. So. I'm sure he would. I'm sure he would. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't want to speak against Elon, so um, <laughs> I'm not going to say that that's not happening. Um, I think that in the far future, that is definitely something that will just become a part of, of humanity and its progress. Um, but for now, the development and, and science and our resources should probably be focused across the development still. I think a lot of people have become rather more interested in space travel since that movie, The Martian, which <laughs> I, I don't know if you saw it or read the book, but I mean, it, 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 it humanized and popularized the whole business. A guy you know, basically using his own shit to uh, grow potatoes in it. Yeah. You know, and he was the first gardener in space, according to the story. Do you think that we will popularize space travel in that way and get people really interested in sending us to the, the other, other planets in the solar system? I certainly hope so. Um, a, a, a very critical thing that people often forget and that actually links to that is that um, space or any science industry needs everyone. You need the gardeners, the farmers, you need um, people that understand uh, marketing, you need people that understand climate, you need people that understand people, you need space psychologists, um, you need everyone involved. So the more of a human larger approach it becomes, the more normalised it will become over time as well. And do you think Australia is the logical place to do that from? We are in Brisbane here today. Should we be building a space station out there somewhere to launch rockets from, Bris from, <laughs> from Australia? Brisbane, Brisbane uh, if you like, yes. I think Australia has the opportunity to become a really big player in the space industry. Um, and I'm not just saying that because I'm conveniently in Australia. 
Um, I know NASA and, and SpaceX and the European Space Agency and Japan, they all have large established organizations. But one of the big benefits of being here is that we can use all of the resources that are coming up now. So the space agency in itself and the space industry in Australia is brand new. So we have the opportunity to shape what that looks like. And instead of playing catch up, we can push forward and make jumps um, where larger, older institutions might still be stuck in certain ways and developments. And so, uh, I mean, for, for particularly for the audience, I'm not, I'm not sure I know the answer either. These rockets that you actually go out and set off somewhere, I mean, <laughs> where, first of all, where do you set them off? And secondly, how big are they? I mean, are they going to come down on the top, top of me and crush me <laughs> or are they just uh, tiny little rockets like I used to let off on Guy Fawkes night in the UK where he just lit the fuse and retired to a safe distance? <laughs> We do retire to a safe distance, and no, I don't think anyone in Brisbane needs to be worried about rockets landing on top of their houses or cars anytime soon. Um, and we go, we do travel out west um, to more more outback Queensland to actually launch. And rockets can can vary in, in diameter. Sometimes there's value in launching the very small components to test very specific GPS trackers or um, or developments in that regard. Uh, the largest. Um, airframe that we're working on is about 12 inches in diameter, looking more than four or five metres tall. So they're still not massive, but um, they're definitely something cool to look at. Do they ever blow up? Do they Even <laughs> Musk's ones do occasionally, but do yours? To date, no. Um, is there the, the scientific probability of that ever occurring? Yes, but it's very small and uh, we try to keep it that way. Okay, well, I think that you've probably excited a younger generation of new people to come up and start start making rockets themselves. I guess the advice that you'd want to give them be would be join a club rather than doing it yourself. Um, it would be it would be join a club, but I think there's a lot of value in doing your own research as well. My main recommendation is to um, to engage with science across the board. If if that is not in year eleven or twelve, that doesn't mean you can't still get motivated and get involved in this industry. Well, Myrta, thank you very much for that insight into what is obviously for you a very interesting area and one which is of practical use in the long run too, I suspect. Now, we're going to move on to the next talk and that will be from Bianca Lee. Now, Bianca is uh, the Director of Cell Cellular Agriculture Australia and that sounds really interesting to me. I know nothing about cellular agriculture and I'm hoping that you're going to be able to inform us about what it's all about. Absolutely. Um, it's an emerging industry and research field, so the majority of people don't know what it is. Um, what people do know, though, at the moment, is that industrial animal agriculture is currently one of the biggest contributors to so many of our world's most pressing challenges, from greenhouse gas emissions to deforestation and biodiversity loss, food insecurity, antimicrobial resistance. Uh, and despite this, Food like meat and eggs and dairy are so ingrained in our everyday life. It's cheap, it's delicious, it's convenient. And trying to tell the whole world to become vegan or vegetarian is not going to solve these problems. And, you know, we all want to eat delicious food, but no one wants to feel bad about it. And so fortunately, scientists and technologists are figuring out a way to, instead of changing you know, 8 billion people's diets, but instead creating these animal products more sustainably. So cellular agriculture is dedicated to producing all those animal products without the animal. So much like the regenerative medicine industry and research field is dedicated to producing organs for, for sick patients um, without the donor, cellular agriculture is about producing food without the animal. Okay, and uh, how far have we got towards this goal of a nice fillet steak on the table, which <laughs> tastes and looks like a fillet steak, but didn't ever see a cow? Yeah, so it's still in a new industry, uh, but only recently Singapore released um, the very first chicken nugget made through cellular agriculture and has sold it at um, restaurants. In Australia, there are currently no companies or restaurants selling this product, but it is a growing industry and, you know, it, it makes sense because Australia is one of the world leaders in stem cell technology and regenerative medicine. So my job is essentially to foster that industry and that environment and make sure that there is more talent coming into the field. And do you eat your product? 
Well, I haven't actually tasted the product yet, but I am really looking forward to the day when I can. <laughs> well, I have an edge on you there because I actually had some uh, en engineered pork many years ago in, in Edinburgh and Scotland. It was awful, to be quite blunt. Uh, and they, <laughs> yeah, said, they, said, they said it was good, but uh, they didn't convince me. But I, I can see that, there is, that it, was, it was getting in the right direction. Is it going to be sustainable? I mean, is, is, this, is this really an alternative to cows, pig, pig, sheep, or is it uh, merely just another way of making protein which is equally uh, impactful on the environment? Well, just like with any um, problem in the world, there's no one single solution. So um, in addition to making sure that we're eating less um, factory farmed meat and uh, clearing more precious, valuable land, we want to ensure that the meat that we do produce is um, sustainable. And because at the moment, since uh, very few companies, there's just one company that are actually producing this product to scale, um, we don't know to the extent of how sustainable it will be but already a lot of modelling has shown that cellular agriculture will produce 70 to 90% less greenhouse gas emissions, use about 90% less land, and the whole process can be used, um, can be produced using uh, renewable energy. So that in itself is going to be way more sustainable and ethical compared to animal agriculture. So tell me, how did you get into this area? I mean, tell me about your career so far, if you like. Sure. My pathway into science is a bit of a cliche. Um, when I was in high school, I had a really inspiring uh, science teacher. She was new, um, well, she was a woman, so that alone was really rare at my school. But she was just cool and inspiring, and that made science cool and inspiring. And she was also particularly strict, so she really made us work really hard. And you know, before that, I didn't think I was particularly talented at science, but because she was so strict and I worked so hard for all my assignments, I distinctly remember after handing um, an essay in, she pulled me aside and said, you really need to consider a career in science. And it's those small, you know, interactions like that that are so important for young, impressionable people. Um, she also actually invited you, Ian, to my school um, all those years ago to talk about your research and your vaccine. And that, again, um, was one of the contributors to why I got into science in the first place. Um, but since then, I knew I wanted to be a researcher. So I did uh, a Bachelor of Science, got into um, a research uh, program, an honours degree, and then last year, I uh, graduated from my PhD. And you can see from that photo there, it was during COVID. So I was alone when I submitted my thesis and had a martini in hand. Um, but at that point, my entire career in cell biology and in science was geared towards biomedicine and you know, understanding human health. So tell me how you actually got into working on c cellular agriculture. Sure. So um, when I first learned about the research field, I knew it was something I really wanted to apply my um, learnings in cell biology and after my PhD. And COVID came at a really inappropriate time. You know, I was newly graduated. I couldn't go overseas where a lot of the companies were. And so I really had to look uh, at Australia. And at that time, there were no academic labs working on this. There were two startups in the space, and that was it. And so I really want to focus on my own country and try to build uh, the ecosystem here rather than contributing to that brain drain, which everyone talks about, where people want to go to America or, or Europe to um, work on some of the world's most biggest problems. So that's why I created Cellular Agriculture Australia. OK. Well, I must admit I'm looking forward to uh, being able to sit down to the, with a dinner in front of me that you have prepared <laughs> by your technology, and I can be sure whether it's meat or your meat, if you know what I mean, <laughs> just by the taste. And if I can lose that distinction, I'll know you've got to where you want to get to. Right. I'm looking happy forward. to host that dinner. <laughs> OK, well, there might be quite a few people queuing up to try it, I think. And what you really want to make sure is you get repeat business. That's OK, right. thank, thank you very much for your time this afternoon. We're going to move on now, and we're going to talk to Corey Tutt. Corey Tutt has been the established a program which he calls Deadly Science. And I'm going to start off by asking him what Deadly Science actually is. Corey, over to you. 
Um, well, firstly, you're not going to die. Um, I'm a proud Kamilaroi man. I'm a proud Aboriginal man. And deadly in our language is kind of like a play on words. It's a bit of a slang. So um, what has sort of a negative connotation in the English language for us, um, because, you know, our people have been sort of oppressed, is cool saying deadly means something's cool or awesome. So when you hear deadly science, don't worry, you're not going to die. Um, you might have a really great time because for us it's it's kind of like a slang, like to say something's cool or awesome um, and that's what deadly science means. And what, what's your involvement? How, 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 what, how, what do you actually set out to do with this program? Um, well, we're actually an official charity um, and I started this program because, you know, the, the whole notion you can't be what you can't see. Um, I was, you know, I, when I was younger, I dreamt of being a zookeeper, um, like a lot of kids. Um, but I was, I was pretty much told during my schooling and throughout my life that, you know, young Aboriginal kids don't get into science. Um, stick to footy, stick to art. You know, if you're not good at those things, then you're not really good at anything. Um, and that's not the case because, um, you know, I wanted kids in Australia to grow up and see that they can be anything they want. And the whole version of science is, um, and how we see science, it's, you know, science is an observation and evidence-based facts. Um, and it has no boundaries. Um, just because of the colour of your skin or who your family is should not be a boundary for you exploring science. And it's all around us. And um, I'm going to use a timeless quote, which is... Um, yeah, it's education is freedom and science equals hope. And when I say science equals hope, we look now, we're in the middle of a pandemic. We're looking for um, answers to coronavirus. We're looking for answers on how we can look after this planet. Um, and when I explain it in a, in a way that um, our people were the first scientists, the 65,000 years plus of knowledge, the first astronomers, the first forensic scientists. Um, if, you're a, if you're a fella and you get lost in the bush, the first people to come to get you are the black fellas. You know, that's the forensic science there. You know, you don't see any credit on CSI for that. Um, but, you know, this is, these are the stories that need to be told. These are the conversations that need to be had because kids out there deserve to have the resources and the belief that they can do anything they set their minds to. So, look, we're all born scientists. We start by experimenting in our environment to see how it works. And you, watching my grandchildren growing up, it's very clear that they're natural scientists. They, they, they would take things to bits. Uh, can't put them back together again, but they at least are trying to find out how they do what they do. Somewhere along the way, an awful lot of people seem to lose that interest in science. How should we go about trying to keep that interest going? I know that sort of fits in with your program of Deadly Science, and I'm interested in what you actually can do to encourage young people, particularly young Aboriginal people, to stay in the science. Well, the answer is actually quite simple. And, you know, each one of the, our panellists today display these two qualities and it doesn't matter where you come from, what your background is, what you had for breakfast, and that's passion and purpose. You have the passion to, um, to do something, whether it's, you know, changing the future so you can, we can better look after our planet or creating homegrown meat so we can be better, just better humans and look after animals better or, you know, reduce our impact. That is, that's a passion and the purpose is, is for a better tomorrow. And, you know, with children and with, you know, anyone, whether their passion be, you know, Tesla rockets or, you know, or any form of science, we should be encouraging that. You know, not every person's the same. Um, we're all different. We all, and there's a saying, different strokes for different folks. And I feel like we should be, um, we should be catering our education system and um, the way we do things to the individual, not the majority. Um, you know, if you put your hand up and you ask um, people, do they want to grow up and work in a bank? Some people say yes, some people say no. Um, but if you have a passion, you're already 10, 15 times ahead of where um, someone else is who doesn't have a passion. I'm sure that's true. How, how does your Deadly Science program facilitate all of this through the schools? And tell us a little bit about what you actually do out there. Again, for a long time, um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children across Australia have been encouraged into sport and art, and they're great things, but, you know, that's not all we're good at. We're good at, and you can see today with Millie, we're good scientists. We're the first scientists. Um, you know, we, we are good at so many things, and, you know, part of what Deadly Science does is we make sure that schools out there, remote schools, 
um, kids from as young as you know, as they can crawl to you know, kids my age have access to the resources that they deserve. You know, I want kids out there to have access to books. You know, and not every kid I work with is going to become a scientist, but I'm sure as hell going to make sure they believe that they can. Um, we need to change the, the conversation around science between, you know, encouraging kids to learn and use their imagination. Um, yeah, and we, we kind of, like, as you said, we coach people out of that. And I think with Deadly Science, we're opening doors where we're, we're providing these resources, but we're also providing mentoring and access to, you know, the Carly Noons, the Dr. Carls, because it is important that we're in this together. And it's, you know, and if we really want to have a positive impact on the future, we need to enable our people to um, to prove these the doubt is wrong and, you know, to change science. Because, you know, we should have a voice in STEM because we're the oldest culture in the world. We're the first people that did STEM. So and, you know, that's something that we're really proud of. So we certainly want people uh, to be knowledgeable in science, knowledgeable about what science can do. I mean, if you, there's two ways of trying to work out how the world works. One is science and the other one is guesswork, and we really don't want to too much, do too much of the guesswork. Uh, but the, we can't really expect that everybody is going to be the natural scientist who goes out and solves problems. And we really just have to aim for them to be literate enough in science that they can trust the science that other people produce. Is, do you see that as something that you can encourage through the programs that you use with Deadly Science to try and encourage this idea that science is, in fact, the best source of information? Yeah, definitely. And I, look, this, this might be a bit of a controversial opinion, but I feel a lot of the discord we have with science and the general public now is because the general public can't, can't fit in with science because we've dished out a... Um, a view of science, the general public, that is not attainable to everyday people. Um, you know, often historically we've, um, we've promoted professors that are generally white male professors that aren't, you know, that aren't people of colour. They, pe they aren't women, you know, and we need to promote these groups because the um, majority of the female scientists that I know are brilliant minds and if they were programmed nearly as much as... You know the the men that are incredible scientists, then we would be in a much better place. Um, and I think that you know you can't be, we can't see. So we need to allow people to see what they can be. They yeah. may not choose the route. Yeah, look, I think that's the right approach, and it's a challenging one to go about doing it. One one of the big problems that we face is that the science has led us into places where we've science has become quite distant, as you say, from the majority of people. We all use cell phones, uh, and I doubt if there's a single person amongst the audience today who could actually build a cell phone. My brother tells who did work on building cell phones said that there was no person within the factory where he was designing and engineering the cell phones who could build a cell phone, that if the, if the group of people who were collectively able to make cell phones disappeared, we'd have to start from scratch again to work out how to make one. So I think we've got to try and make science more human as well and uh, explain to people how science is a benefit. The one thing that we recognize very quickly, of course, with science, and particularly with the complex science, is that people are very interested in it while it's being developed. But once it's there, they just want the product. And they forget about the science. They don't even realize that it took 25 years to build all the technology and the science that enables a cell phone. So we've, we've, we've probably got to teach people not only about science, but about the process of developing knowledge through science. And I think that, uh, that that would be one thing I would hope for your program for the future, that it might go that way. Yeah, definitely. Giving, um, you know, with Deadly Science, we aim to give children the skills to, to come up with their own ideas and, um, you know, understand science on any level. And I think that it's just supporting our, our young people into the future. But I'll, I'll put it to you this way. Um, you know, if, we, if we're focusing on, you know, a mobile phone, which is, you know, it, it's really great and it's really valid. It's a great piece of engineering. Um, but if you walk outside and, you know, you happen to see a blue tongue lizard, right? That blue tongue lizard's got a third eye, which allows it to see in colour. It's got a blue tongue, which it's not poisonous, but it's going to tell you it's poisonous by looking at you. Um, it carries all its food in its tail, which means that for three months of the year that it can survive without food and water um, until it rains again and there's food prevalent. This is science that's all around us. 
kids should be experiencing this. Um, the technology is great, but the technology comes from somewhere. Um, the whole idea of solar panels and it conceptualizes with ectotherm reptiles, which use the sun to generate energy. Um, you know, that's where an, an idea of a solar panel actually originates from. So, you know, technology, you know, environment, this is all stuff that should be encouraged. Um, you know, there's like sometimes I think with what we do is we put boundaries up for kids understanding this stuff on a, or, or young people or, um, you know, groups that we just suspect that aren't going to, you know, pursue a career in STEM. And it's, we really need to work on how these are related and so we can understand them. Well, th thank you very much for that, Corey. I think that uh, the message that you're getting out there is one that we need to encourage science literacy through education, and if that applies to all communities, but particularly to our Aboriginal communities if they've not been given that privilege and the chance to get on in science. I'm going to change tack a little bit now. We've got about 15 minutes left to go, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask each of, the f each of our four panellists in turn to, talk, to answer a couple of specific questions, and you can answer them with one word or a whole story, depending on how you feel like. But uh, I'm going to start off with the first one, and I'll give you all forewarning about it, that I'm going to ask you whether there's been a particular mentor or role model that's inspired you along the way. And I'm going to go back to the beginning and start with Amelia, if that's all right. Yeah, of course. Um, honestly, we would be here forever if I just listed all the different people. Um, but there's so many um, significant people in my life. I think when I reflect on, you know, the values that I was brought up with, I think to my parents, um, like my mum and my dad. Um, so my dad's um, Aboriginal in South Sea Island and my mum is um, Pakia, white woman from New Zealand. Um, and I think just their relationship, um, you know, that's really where as kids, like with my brothers, where we first experienced and witnessed injustice and racism um, in the way that people treated mum and dad for being together as a black man and a white woman. Um, and to see the work that my dad has done, um, like in the community that I've grown up in back at home, um, building an organisation that works with our mob around, you know, keeping families together because of the... Um, you know, all of what we have endured, like the trauma, the way that that means that we treat one another um, and being able to support our people that are, that are struggling um, with, you know, whether it be drugs or alcohol, domestic violence, like that's the sort of work that my dad does. And, and that comes from a place where, um, you know, he experienced a lot of that growing up and he broke the cycle for us as kids. Um, and that's something I'm forever in debt to my father for, but also my mum, because she played a role in dad's life um, where she was the one that, you know, really stopped him from from continuing that cycle too. So, um, yeah, I, I get emotional thinking about it, but really for me, it's my parents and that long line of family that we come from. Thank you very much for that. I'm, I'm going to turn to Myrta now and uh, ask her exactly the same question. Who's your inspiration? Who's your role model? Um, I think that um, in, a, in, a, in a similar sense, if I start listing off everyone that I thought was inspiring, um, we'd be here indefinitely. <laughs> um, but I think the biggest impact uh, on my life has actually come from, from individuals that have made very small contributions um, for every uh, person that says, yes, there'll be 100 people that tell you no and that you can't do something and that something is too hard. Um, and the biggest impact has come from people that could have been a, a small administrative staff member to, um, to anyone else that has said, yeah, you know what, we're going to give you the chance to do this. Um, or, yeah, why not? Those people have made the biggest difference in my life. It's not been a singular mentor or an inspiration in that sense. It's every one of us. OK, we'll turn to Bianca now and see what she has to say. Sure. I guess right now, um, at this point in my life, it's the team that I currently manage and work with at Cellular Agriculture Australia. They're the ones that, you know, make me so inspired to get out of bed and do the work that we do because they're all so passionate and so, you know, they all come from completely different backgrounds with completely different experiences, different skill sets. I'm constantly learning from them and you know, we're really missing that face-to-face -face interaction and having our remote brainstorming sessions have been probably the most, um, yeah, inspiring thing that uh, makes me so proud of the work that we do together. Thank you. And Corey, your turn now. Um, yeah, I, like, I get inspiration 
from pretty much everyone I, I speak to, like even the panel members, just hearing them talk, I, I sort of get a warm feeling inside from when I was a kid. And, um, you know, my, my inspiration has probably been my grandfather. Um, he was, you know, he was a very sweet man that he never really got the opportunity to learn how to read or write. Um, but, you know, he saw the need to teach me how to read, um, even though he didn't know how to read himself. And, you know, he gave me my first book, which, um, you know, it was enough to for me to find a passion in wildlife. And, you know, I probably wouldn't be here if it wasn't for my pop. So I'd say my pop's my, my biggest inspiration. But it, it really, I take a bit of inspiration from everyone because I think that, um, you know, we have a very beautiful world that, is full of knowledge, the things that we can study and observe. And I think that, um, you know, there's always lessons. So I'd just like to say everyone and my fault. <laughs> okay, well, I'm going to answer my own question to some extent and say mm -hmm. that my inspiration was a guy called Spike, who was my physics teacher. And he, the inspiration that he gave me was the, the right to challenge him and try out experiments and see if I was right or wrong. I was usually wrong and he was usually right, but the important thing was he gave me that freedom and that's stuck with me all the way through my science career. So thinking about another question altogether, uh, careers in science are a mixture of hard work and good luck. Uh, I'm gonna start with Myrta again this time, do a different order. I'm gonna ask you, where did hard work fit in and how much of it was good luck that you've ended up where you are? Cool. Um, I actually changed my mind as you read out, um, mentioned the question there. Um, I think the, there is a 40% luck um, in there as well. And that is not luck because of um, a specific location or where I was born or, or anything else that we mentioned. That's been luck of meeting people um, that were willing to give opportunities um, similar to the previous answer. So luck in the sense that um, it's a luck that was created by resilience and by going back and trying again uh, until you find that person that's going to support you and, and make a difference and have an impact that way. Thank you. Uh, Bianca, how about you? Um, I'm going to give a cop-out answer and say um, both. But uh, what I find that makes the best scientists are people who really know how to work in teams, people who you know can network and collaborate, and are really infectious with their passion and their energy. I think that's um, has what made me a really you know passionate and and um, and successful scientist. It's the people around me and the fact that I um, can work together with with so many different minds. That's probably my advice. <laughs> uh, Corey, your turn now. Um, look, I would, I'm going to have to say a couple of things. Um, I think resilience is a, is a big one. Um, you have to be prepared to sometimes get a no. Um, and sometimes, yeah, sometimes the door might shut on you and you need to knock it down. Um, you know, and I think it, luck comes into it. But with me, I mean, like, when I started Deadly Science, I was working two jobs. I broke my foot carrying boxes of books to the post office. Um, this is this is a resilience because the amount of people that sort of um, told me it was a bad idea or um, said don't do it, um, you know, if I hadn't have had that resilience to sort of say, you know what, like I, I can take your criticism, I can formulate a view and um, make changes on the run, then you know it probably wouldn't have happened. So I think resilience and toughness and the ability to learn, um, and we need that. Um, we need our scientists to be resilient because. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of people telling you you can't do things and no and I think that that's a big one for me. Okay, and Amelia, what about you? Yeah, I mean, I think Corey really hit that nail on the head for me around resilience um, because for me this question is, you know, to answer it we've got to acknowledge the current system that we live in and the world that we live in where some people's lives and knowledge um, is valued more than others. And, you know, realistically, um, people who've been in marginalised communities, um, people of colour, First Nations, black, brown people, often have to work 10, 20, I don't know the exact numbers, but, like, 
have to work harder to fight for a voice and fight for space and fight to have positions of power that people, you know, born into privilege. And not that that's necessarily a bad thing, but it's true. Um, and we have to acknowledge that, you know, I think it has come up even, you know, in, in Corey's story and Bianca's too, like the impact that having a, a female science teacher has or, you know, um, seeing the gap and then fighting to fill that for our people um, is so important. So, um, you know, we... Yeah, when I think to the the work that we've done, all the people that have been a part of building Seed Mob to where we are, like we've worked out. I need to be mindful of my language there, <laughs> um, but we've worked incredibly hard. Um, and to yeah, to think about everything that we've had to sacrifice along the way, like it's not easy. Um, when it comes to the luck side of it, I don't think it's luck. I think for a bunch of our work, when I've known that we're on the right path, is where like the stars feel like they're aligning. And to me, that's like our ancestors guiding us. And it might feel like luck in the moment, but I think it's that. Um, you know, being able to identify, okay, yeah, we're doing the right thing here and we need to keep going. And yes, you know, there's going to be hurdles along the way and, and that's where the resilience comes in. So yeah, hard work, absolutely. Um, and then finding the right path. Yeah, I can only say that that's been true for my career too. Uh, we've got a few minutes left and I'm going to ask you one question about the future and uh, basically you've all done some pretty amazing things each one of the panelists have clearly in their own field done something out, outstanding but equally you're young and I'm old and uh, I don't look forward quite so much to what will happen in the future but you guys have got a future to look forward and what I want each of you to think about is where are you going to be in 10 years time where's all of this leading to I'm going to start with Amelia and see what do you hope to see happening for seed 10 years from yeah. now I hope to see, um, you know, so many young people that are either involved in what we're doing right now or who will be involved um, leading action and solutions in their communities across the country um, with, you know, resources and support to make that happen. Like, I think a lot about how many amazing ideas there are out there, whether they're like scientific ideas or, or you know, getting more mob back out, managing country. Um, like there's there's just so many awesome things that people want to be doing, but don't have the resources and support to do it. And so I hope that in 10 years time, you know, people are not just dreaming about doing those things, but that they're happening and they've got the backing from their own community, but also, um, you know, non-Indigenous people and people who have resources to make it happen. Okay, Corey, uh, Deadly Science raises funds for helping schools in science, but I gather recent, over recent times you've had to do other things in relation to the bushfires. Where do you see it going over the next 10 years for you? Oh, look, um, again, I'm going to go back to the, the old saying is passion and purpose. I want to see a generation of strong, deadly scientists with that burning passion and that purpose. And, you know, I think that deadly science, you know, in a perfect world, we wouldn't have to send resources because communities and schools would have those resources. But right now they don't. And we need to be here, you know, in the long term to give to give access to our mob and keep our, keep our kids deadly and love and science. And I think that um, I, I would really like to think that, you know, deadly science, you know, outlives me in the sense of like, you know, I want this to be an organisation for our people, not not just my organisation. I just want this to be something that our people can look to for answers. If they're, you know, if they're getting told they can't do science, I want them to look towards deadly science, and deadly science can, you know, turn the light on. And um, I think, you know, again, you can't be what you can't see. So I, I want deadly science to be a shining light for the next generation of deadly scientists. And I think that um, we only do that together. So if you you know, just like Seed Mob, I get behind us and you know support us because you know there's a word called multi-falsification, which I know you're going to love, physics word, world, the word, mm -hmm. sorry. And um, if we're all in this together, then it's going to be a much easier thing. So um, jump on board and follow these great organisations. Thank you, Corey. Uh, Bianca, uh, you were probably looking forward to a, a meat-free, meaty future. <laughs> uh, 10 years long enough? Are we going to see it all happen in that time? 
Well, yeah, hopefully within 10 years, no one asks me, what is cellular agriculture? Because by then it will be a household name. But hopefully by then, you know, cellular agriculture can unite vegans with meat eaters, farmers with animal activists, you know, making sure that we're all in it. People from different sides of the spectrum are all in it to solve some of our world's most pressing challenges. Um, but me personally, in terms of my science career, I have no idea what I'm going to be doing in 10 years' time, and I'm okay with that because there are so many opportunities and pathways in the world of science, and I'm, I'm really excited about that. Well, I can only echo the, sci the, the, the excitement of having science to look forward to. It's certainly been true all through my career. Uh, Myrta, last of all, uh, sci rocket science is changing. It used to be governments that did rocket science. Now it's Elon Musk. Where is it going in the future? What do you think is going to happen? Um, I hope that more and more individuals, startups, small businesses, and in my case, even students, um, can get actively involved in that industry, in developing each and every component, in collaborating internationally, um, instead of keeping it very secluded and specific. Um, and I guess that kind of applies in a broader sense to, to science as a whole as well. Um, I'd like people uh, to develop their voice, have a voice, um, in science, um, have that voice recognised in, in politics as well um, and see how all of us in, in all of our respective industries can make that better. Um, the space industry is changing, yes, but so is the rest of the world. Um, and I personally hope to, to continue having an impact on that in whatever way, shape or form. But what I hope to see um, above all is more and more young people and others um, to also, also have an impact on that over the coming years. Well, thank, thank you for that, Amelia. We're coming to the end of the time that we've got together, and I think it would be appropriate at this point to thank each of the four speakers. We've had some really interesting f insights into what inspired you in science, what you're trying to achieve, and where you think things are going to go. So Amelia, Coria, Bianca, and Myrta, thank you very much for your contribution to this interesting look into the future of science and perhaps most importantly, uh, the future for the general public from science, because science will drive our future. And I'd like to thank the, the, the World Science Festival Brisbane for the opportunity for you to present your really interesting insights and to look forward to next year's World Science Festival, where we'll hear what the outcomes of all your various work has been. Thank you very much, everybody, for taking part this afternoon, and thank you very much for your attendance and your interest in the subject of science. wonders, the friendly faces, and incredible new adventures that will change you and the way you see the world. Right here in Queensland.